The material act producing a death with dignity in the Oregon Death with Dignity Act is left unclear. These are my findings. Second, the primary agency is mitigated. That means it's restricted. The patient, although there are appeals to radical patient autonomy, there's a restriction to patient autonomy. Third, the operative underpinnings, or the operative, the operative underpinning is a naturalistic utilitarianism. This, that last slide was basically the bottom line of this presentation. The material act is, amb uh, is ambiguous. Action is not found in the construction of the act. And construction of the act is a technical term, a legislative term in the act. That's 3.14, which we'll see later. You don't find it there. It is ambiguous also because it's only alluded to in the insurance section of the act. And note the word, the suggested request form. In other words, not the permanent request form, but the suggested. The construction of the act, this is how you'll see it in the voters' pamphlet and in the, uh, on the uh, legislative docket. It looks like this. It says, nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize a physician or any other person to end the patient's life by lethal injection, mercy killing, or active euthanasia. Part B. Actions taken in accordance with this act shall not for any purpose constitute suicide, mercy killing, or homicide under the law. <laughs> yes, I see some looks on your faces. A few of you might be confused. What does that mean? First of all, let me ask you this. Query. Look at 3.14a. What's missing? All right, this is a construction of the act. What is missing? What is it? What is hap what is, is there anything that's a sufficient and necessary condition to cause termination of life? It tells you what the act isn't. It doesn't ever tell you what the act is. It tells you what it doesn't do until you come to B, where it says actions taken in accordance with this act. That means if you follow section one and section two, Anything that would follow under the legal categories of suicide, mercy killing, or homicide are negated. And if you take that back to the first section A, you remove mercy killing, active euthanasia, and anything else, any other type of action that would constitute those. This is a very important point because when I was on the task force, immediately the Hemlock Society jumped right in and says, oh, this act does permit lethal injection and convorkian type devices. And they come right to this point here. Another uh, thing I would like to point out is where did this come from? This comes from the Living Will, the Patient Self-Determination Act, as it's laid out in the Oregon legislature. So the door is open to use living wills for patients who, are not, uh, who do not have decision-making capacity. The people who crafted this did it in a very clever and brilliant manner. Next slide, please. Allusions to oral ingestion. Now, I couldn't put the entire um, text on, and anytime you see three dots, you should have red flags raised. But I had to use the three dots, so you can look in my full text and read it. Section 3.13, or 3.13b, the, the insurance and annuity policy, which is an odd place to find the construction mentioned, says, neither shall a qualified patient's act of ingesting medication to end his or her life nullify or obviate annuities or life insurance policies. This is the only place where the word ingesting is used. So it's an allusion to it. So what happens if you have a lethal injection and they broaden it? Does that mean your, your insurance policies are safe? Think about it. Now, by the way, this was crafted by an insurance attorney for standard insurance. I, um, that's rather interesting, I think, in itself. Section 6, which is the suggested form of request, says that when I expect to die, I expect to die when I take, take the medication to be prescribed. You know, I'm a pharmacist. I've worked in hospital pharmacy 18 years. And I know that if you're going to use a suppository, it's insert. If you're going to use drops, it's place. If you're going to use 
um, insulin, we often say inject. If you're going to use topical medication, it's apply. What does take mean? When you get your pharmacy, this is, this is secundamartum. This is the practice of the art in pharmacy. You use take for oral administration. Now, I was a bit confused. I said to myself, self, I don't quite understand what they're trying to say here. So, I called Mr. Stutzman, the attorney from Standard Insurance and one of the three primary petitioners, and I said, I don't understand what are the routes of administration that are included in this particular piece of uh, legislation or initiative. And he said, um, well, it's oral, Jerome. I think it's oral, but you better talk to Dr. Peter Goodwin and he'll clarify it. So I talked to P Dr. Peter Goodwin and he said, well, yes, it's oral and of course, and I said, well, I'm a little concerned about oral. I'm not quite sure that of the efficacy of that particular route for terminating life. And he said, well, um, it, it's oral. Don't worry about that. So I said, can I have that in writing? And I, oh, that's not a problem. I never received the letter, so finally I sent a letter off in all formality, you know, with a notary public, you do the whole thing to it, to let somebody know you're monitoring them. And uh, now because I was not in Oregon at any part of this process, they didn't know who I was. So they couldn't tell if I was a friend or foe, as they'd say in, in the Golden Spurs of Belgium. I can't say that, by the way, Hank, in uh, Flemish. I would have had my throat cut. There have been many that tried to do that anyway. Anyway, back to this. He states in a personal, in personal correspondence to me, I never did check with my attorney if this is safe, but anyways, in personal correspondence to me, I am not competent to respond concerning questions of routes of administration and written lists of medications, but we'll bring it up at the next meeting. Fascinating. I found this fascinating. Why? Well, he's one of the main petitioners, right? Three months earlier, he debated Derek Humphrey relative to the crafting of this act, and the debate was precisely over lethal injection or oral route. Now, perhaps this is a case for persantine, for those who are having a bit of anoxia and memory loss. I don't know. Perhaps it was a, la a loss of memory. I have no idea, but in any um, way, shape, or form, this man is a petitioner, and he's not competent to explain the routes of administration in a major act that's going to change the entire law of my state and the practice of, of medical personnel such as pharmacists and physicians. That's unique. But be as it may, let's go to Dr. Goodwin. Next slide. Example of apparent crafter contradiction. In the pamphlet, What Healthcare Professionals Need to Know About Oregon's Death with Dignity Act, September 94, it states in numerous places, in bold print, the Oregon Death with Dignity Act does not authorize lethal injection, mercy killing, or active euthanasia, and the name below the brochure is Dr. Peter Goodwin. Dr. Or, uh, attorney, Mr. Botari received a letter because Coalition for Compassionate Care says Kevorkian devices are permitted in this. They threatened to litigate against them unless they withdrew that particular statement from their pamphlets. Funny thing, Nightline, Ted Koppel, number 3533, December 7th, 1994, page one of the manuscript of the discussion with Dr. Feiger, Dr. Goodwin, and Ted Koppel, he says, well, come on. Ted Koppel asks him, says, come on, doesn't this really permit lethal injection? And they're in this discussion, and Dr. Goodwin says, well, you know, if the patient had a gadget similar to that that Kevorkian used and wanted to do it that way, it's my belief that that would not be excluded. What? In your pamphlets, you say no lethal injection? And now you're talking about using a prescription medication, mind you, not a carbon monoxide mask, but a prescription medication through a device, which would be a device of injection, in order to terminate the patient's life. There's an apparent contradiction here. Next slide, please. 
this leads me to a reflection. If indeed we are going to restrict the act to oral administration, there is no proven mechanism in this particular country approved by the FDA that allows such medical practice. You in practice then would be subjecting yourselves to participate in an unproved and unsafe medical practice. It's based on lethal dose 50s. That's what the lethal dose of medications are based upon. That means 50% of the people die and 50% don't. And there really isn't any data in America that will let you know what a successful lethal dose of oral medication might be. That is a difficulty because what kind of precedent will you be setting? Does that mean then in the future medicine you can just go out and begin practicing things that are unproven and unsafe? Another reflection is the problem with intent. It was suggested that this is a means to an end. We bring in the notion and concept of assisted suicide, we lay it out as safe in order to get the public to accept it and then we broaden it to lethal injection. Now how does that affect the notion of informed consent? Questionable, questionable biblical precedent, and I will get to that. Dr. Sally, or Reverend Sally Ray Henderson says that this is a biblical principle that you can commit suicide because it's not condemned in the scripture, and I will show you a little bit later on where she gives four scriptural passages. Next slide, please. Unsafe practice. Now, I can see that uh, this is what, I, by the way, I use, I, I'm one of those people who made Bill Gates, uh, uh, I made part of his $12 billion, and this is uh, part of his $12 billion here. You can see very clearly the notations on the bottom and on the side, but if you can't, I'll explain the, to you what they are. Elapsed time, this is from the Remlink report, elapsed time between beginning euthanasia or assisted suicide until death. In the column on, your, on my right, you will see one minute or less. The next is one to 10 minutes. And by the way, the descriptor on the top is 35% of the patients. This is a sample of 100 patients. At 10 minutes, the, at the third column in the middle is 10 minutes to one hour. And what I want to point out is the columns to my left, the one hour to one day, one day to one week, one to four weeks. Eight patients fall in the category of, now these are out of 100, of one day to four weeks. An interesting way of dying with dignity. And if those of you have seen barbiturate poisoning, you know about toxic psychosis, necrosis of large muscle mass, you know about renal failure. I'm not quite sure that this is what Mr. Figer had in mind as a death with dignity. But you be the judge of that after all. We all are individually autonomous. The danger here is that if someone uses a barbiturate, they may not, next slide please, die. Now here the application of the plastic bag was on the wrong part of the body. It was on the lower part of the body. Um, this, I'm not sure who this man was, but he, he woke up from his dogmatic slumbers thinking he was going to be dead, but you can say, you take a quite look at him and one may say it's a possibility that he could be diagnosed with toxic psychosis from the failed attempt. Next slide, please. Unproven and unsafe practice is admitted. Cheryl Smith, who's an attorney and, a quite, and she studied euthanasia laws and she helped craft the first two drafts of this measure, said in her studies, and she has written a book on this, on drugs used for final exit, She's a member of the Hemlock Society and now the um, Euthanasia Research and Guidance Organization, ergo. By the way, they change their names about every two or three years and it's very difficult to find out who's who in the game. She says, in 20% of the cases, the death will take up to four days to occur. 
Dr. Admiral's study, which I haven't seen but has been quoted uh, numerous times in the Oregon newspapers, say 75% of the patients die within 24 hours. The remainder can last two days or longer. The president and founder of the Hemlock Society and purist in the pro-euthanasia movement, or I should say pro-medicide, um, says, and there's evidence that I have accumulated, shows that about 25% of assisted suicides fail, which casts doubt upon the Oregon law. And he calls the Oregon law in the same article in the New York Times disastrous. Now, I find that a bit fascinating. Why would you want to give major support to a law that's disastrous and has doubt? Next slide, please. I want to point out the public policy application. Lethal injection is the playing field. The playing field, we cannot allow those in the pro medicide movement to allow allusions to oral dosing to be the playing field. If you and I permit that, we will lose the battle. That's a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling because you get the notion that I'm going to take eight or nine capsules and I would gently drift off. You know it takes at least 90 capsules of 100 milligram barbiturate pentobarbital in order to at least get an LD50? Can you imagine? Here you are. Here you are. Okay. Let's, you've heard of Visualize World Peas. Well, I want you to visualize this. You are a cancer patient in your terminal stage. You may, you're in late stage disease. Let's even make it worse. Now, of course, this is, this is a, almost a straw man fallacy, but it's that time of season. You have a gastric carcinoma, and you wish to have a death with dignity. You're nauseous, and now you're going to take 90 capsules and swallow them? Well, let's, let's, let's look at the Dutch experiment, and we'll put it in a solution, a final solution. And we'll drink that. You know what the pH of that solution is and what that does to what, what it does to your gastrointestinal lining? Okay, we'll medicate you with anti nauseans The point that I'm saying is that this is not such a pleasant process nor a sure process for a death with dignity. The initiative must be fought on the field of intent not euphemism. And if you don't bring away anything from public policy in your future battles, and you will have future battles, in this particular dialogue, remember it. The intent, not euphemism. The playing field is lethal injection, and what you saw last night is precisely what Dr. Petty and I went through, and others, Dr. Toffler, in Oregon. They will not deal with the facts. They will dance around you. They'll do a special pleading. They'll plead to your emotions. Arguments ad populum, you will see those and they'll be thrown in your face. Next slide, please. Why did they do this? They did a Roper poll. Er, who's they? He used the word they. Ergo did a Roper poll. And by the way, uh, let's see, Gallup is a proponent of euthanasia and he participated in this and funded part of it. They did this Roper poll. What's in a word? And uh, you can't read it. Again, I thank Michael Ga or Bill Gates for this. Uh, I didn't realize this until the slides came out and the fellow was on, went on vacation. To the, let me explain this. In the red, you see voter preference for. In the blue, you see voter preference against. The caption above says, Metacide, Euphemism, and Voter Preference. They, ergo, did this to decide what words were best used for voters to select. They crafted the entire act on a poll of what words the voters would select in order to get their particular initiative passed. Remember that one? Yes. Well, what we have here, take a look over here where it says lethal injection. That's uh, the second bunch of bars over from my left. That is about 41% of the people would vote for lethal injection. Take a look over here to the highest bar, which would be uh, two over from my right. 68% would vote for a death with dignity. Now, if I can possibly get to this place in my text, I will read a little note from 
Cheryl Smith. They got in an argument over this internal debate. You notice, um, by the way, Derek Humphrey is no longer part of Hemlock. Uh, he's, he's too much of a purist, so he's separated, and that's why he's an ergo. And if you read the last US, uh, U.S. News and World Report around the first or second week of June, you'll notice that there's a schism in the organization. There are the purists who say everyone should be permitted youth, uh, suicide, metacide, that is a consenting adult, and then there are the more moderate sorts that say no, only those with terminal illness. Oh, by the way, everyone I see in this room looks to me as if they have terminal illness. So, what did Cheryl um, Smith say about this? Well, she capitulated and so did Derek Humphrey. They said, we wanted to know what works. Does this sound like Leo Alexander's warning, nine, remember that July 14th, 1949, where he said, beware of those who use the Hegelian ethic of what is useful is good? Next slide. Well, we'll actually return to uh, two back, one more back. So what I'm saying is that they crafted this particular act on euphemism, and it worked. They lost in Washington, and they lost in California, and this is no ad hominem. They learned to mutate as other organisms to things that are, that are more productive, more survivable. Next slide, please. Well, what about the theological perspective? By the way, are there any Hemlock Society members here today? Um, what I would like to demonstrate here is in Sally Ray Henderson's, to those in the hemlocks, say that Sally Ray Henderson's approach, she suggested that the scripture permitted euthanasia by not coming out against it. For those theologians here, they, she said that she proposed that the euthanasia of Jesus Christ by the Roman centurion was an act of mercy. Secondly, she looked at the suicide of Saul, the suicide of Ahithophel. He, he left David's, uh, remember he, he basically betrayed David. David left the city with, and Absalom was in reign. David came back. It was suboptimal. Ahithophel disemboweled himself. And then the suicide of Zimri. Now, um, in my theological studies of exegesis, I remember being taught in the hermeneutic that one must look at the context. What is the context? Is there a rote draht? Is there a common thread through the entire context here? I would submit to you that Zimri, where it says, for instance, he was more sinful than all his fathers. He went in and burned himself in the house. The uh, suicide of Ahithophel, he betrayed David the king, chosen king of Israel. The suicide of Saul, remember he went to see a uh, medium, lost in the battle and killed himself? The proposed suicide of Jesus, what I would suggest that each one of those were in states of sin and that they would not be appropriate models for Christians to follow, at least the best models. Another thing, as I like to point out, is that none of these are in the context of someone suffering terminal illness, are they? What's, what area in the scripture do you find terminal illness being addressed? The book of Job. You want to look at terminal illness and the possibility of dying and suffering? The next slide, please. Findings in the medical ethical clarification mitigated patient autonomy. Next slide. Mitigated patient autonomy. The ex essence of the discussion in Oregon is will to power. Now, I'm not a Nietzschean, by the way, but it's, it's, this was, to me, I will, I will plead my case. There are power operatives in this notion of will to power, and there are four, at least four mitigating agents. And I would like to focus on the last one because I won't get into a deep discussion over at this point in time. The um, social system. Uh, someone, I've been constantly asked, 
what's the status of the law now? The law is enjoined by Justice Hogan, and we have been waiting for the past three months for him to, make his, uh, to render his opinion. So it has not been implemented. In the legislation, the Hemlock Society and their members have wisely put their people on every single committee that would form opinion for implementation and broaden it to lethal injection. I find this patently deceptive. If those who are pro-euthanasia advocates or pro-medicide advocates want the will of the people, they should make it very plain. Because we're talking about, do the people want lethal injection and a safe way to exit? Or do the people want to be coaxed into believing that there's a bit of safety in something else? Now, Derek Humphrey, off to say, at least was honest about it. He said, it has to be lethal injection. Barbara Coombs Lee, Peter Goodwin, and Eli Stutzman crafted it in euphemism. Is that informed consent? What does that state for the future? Next slide, please. Mitigated patient autonomy. The execution of an agent's will to realize metacide is dependent upon the types of power they are able to actualize. Next slide. There are, according to Kathleen Koch, 10 types of power. I found nine of them, uh, one subsumed another category. The formal power, expert power, sanction, etc. you can read them as well as I. These are different type of powers that are having interplay. Next slide. The physician is a secondary agent. That means you cannot actualize or execute assisted suicide without the secondary agent, the physician, be, being part of the causal complex. If the physician does not say that, yes, you have a prognosis of dying within six months, which I think is whistling in the dark, but if you can't say that, you cannot access this particular law. The expert power is also used in assessment of decision-making capacity. If you're not looked at as emotionally stable, you cannot participate in assisted suicide in Oregon. Formal authority, if the physician says, I and my personal conscience say that I don't want to participate in this, the patient does not have the radical autonomy that the patient wishes. Next slide. Illusion of patient choice and in-life decisions. There, there, this is an illusion. Radical autonomy, according to numerous studies, and you'll find them in Oren Lichter's JAMA 267.15, page 201 and following, he says a number of studies suggest that the physician values may be more decisive than the patient values. And if you look at the reasons behind it, the physician's will predominates. And here's some reasons why. The physician informs the patient using their own value framework. The patient who is vulnerable, sick, and frightened often will buy into and put their framework and their value system into that of the physician's. The physician's unaware of the patient's values and he may oppose them, uh, his values on their own will. The physician judges that the patient's unable to make a meaningful judgment and therefore imposes his own. These things are not done often consciously. They're done in the relationship. Next slide. The pharmacist is a secondary agent. I, as a pharmacist, have procedural power. It's mandatory for me to counsel you when you come into my, my, uh, my office. I must choose a drug that will do exactly what the physician wishes. I must also assess the emotional competency of the patient. When I hand you that medication, I'm saying, now there's a 50% likelihood that you may die and if you emotionally break down in front of me, I have to assess if you're competent or not to be able to administer this medication in compliance with the law. That puts me, if nothing else, in a place of legal liability. Next slide, please. Institution as a secondary agent. They have formal power and resource power. The clinical, the clinical hospital determines if it will or will not participate. And as Legacy did, they said, those, because of our value system in our hospital, people who wish to participate cannot use our inventory. Now, this will be contested by uh, um, Cheryl Scott, who is a pain manager at one of the main Legacy hospitals. And I don't think, according to the law, that Legacy has a leg to stand on. Next slide. Caring for the sick, an emerging industrial byproduct. 
You who are physicians understand and have tasted managed care. My concern is not so much for the physician right now. What my concern is for you who are placed in a situation where you will have pressures brought to bear upon you by your employer. If your stats aren't good and you're bringing in a bunch of Christians who are running up the cost of the hospital, decreasing profit margin, you may lose your staff privileges. Oh, Jerome, you're looking for ghosts in closets. Next slide, please. There is a power conflict I think that I can illustrate this with. Fred Meyer, this is the Schulberg policy issued to all pharmacists, all pharmacists including me. Public, it's a public document. Mandatory transfer by non-participating pharmacists in the gag rule. Next slide. This is when worlds collide. Fred Meyer says basically that at no time am I allowed to lecture, give any lecture. What does that mean? Does that mean a consultation? I can give no lecture to the patient. None. Zero. I can't say anything about it. What I can do is if, I'm, if I have a problem with this, I can make an offer to transfer the prescription. And I may say nothing else. I can't tell the, the patient why. I can't tell them that I have a concern you may not die. I have a concern of compliance. I can only say I can transfer the prescription. Now you say, yeah, okay, well, fine, but I don't see that that's relevant. I know a pharmacist who worked in a particular North uh, um, Portland hospital who was looking at therapeutic abortions. Every Friday night we had him scheduled. And his task was to put progesterone suppositories into the box and send it up. But this pharmacist started noticing the names of the, of the poor Hispanic and black community reoccurring on the list. I thought, well, how can this be therapeutic? What's this about? It was a contraception clinic. And the poor pharmacist, the poor pharmacist, the pharmacist then said, I cannot in good conscience participate in this. They, then they said, well, you don't have to, you don't have to hand the box over or put the suppositories in. The only thing that you have to do is just sign. I can't do that either, the pharmacist said. Well, you just tell you what, you can just watch the person take the right box out so that you have at least that control. And the pharmacist says, well, I can't do that either. Funny thing, three weeks later, there was a cost containment movement in the pharmacy department. And though the pharmacist had seniority, he found himself jobless. Now, who do you think that pharmacist might have been? Anyway, when worlds collide, there's formal power, preference, and participation. It says in Death with Dignity Act 4.012, no health care provider may subject a person to censure, discipline, suspension, etc. That's censure. Next slide. And by the way, if you think you're not going to feel it, what happened to the American College of Gynecology and, and, the, uh, and the trainees who are coming through in termination of pregnancy? Hmm. Operative issues. Religion is the quintessential issue. Though you may be beat over the head with it and say, don't put your religious ideology on me, it is the essential issue. The operative norm is an egoistic utilitarianism. By that means it's the greatest good for my happiness. And on a moral reflection, I will look at some doctrinal aberrations and I will close. Next slide. Religion defined is the verbal and behavioral articulation of a web of belief. The internal encounter and experience with whatever you can see, whatever you believe is your higher power, if it's your socks, your Porsche, your uh, house, your God of Islam, Christianity, um, your bank account, that will articulate, if you feel that that is your highest value, that will articulate, and you believe in that, your verbal discussion and your behavioral um, actions will demonstrate what you believe. And last night's discussion was an, an example of that, a fine example. Next slide. Religion and euthanasia. Derek Humphrey, November 1st, 1994, in an article, The Founding Father. And by the way, he wasn't the founding father of American euthanasia. Charles Potter was. But that's, that's not Derek Humphrey's problem. It's the problem of uh, the Oregonian's uh, writer. The euthanasia movement's clash with religion is at the heart of the struggle. And I totally agree with Derek Humphrey. I think the man is very insightful. We disagree on the ends, but I still think he's a very intelligent man and very insightful. And he says, people lose sight of that, but in a small way it's altering 2,000 years of Christianity. 
small. We have 2,000 year tradition in introducing naturalistic utilitarianism in a place where you have a 2,000 years of Hippocratic ethic and it's a small shift. Maybe. Either way, it's still a religious shift. And it's a religious shift where you have Darwinian naturalism being put, that's a religion. It's an articulation of a web of belief. It's being imposed and put in a place of Judeo-Christianity. The Hemlock society, uh, Society's founder, Derek Humphrey, and I think he is a, uh, he's a good representative, says after reading Darwin's evolutionary theory, thesis, Humphrey concluded God does not exist. It's a um, non-theistic approach. The Euthanasia Society of America's founder is a Unitarian minister and later new humanist, Charles Potter, who basically looked at God as, as uh, maybe something as other, but to him there's no life after death, and this issue is moot. Next, next slide, please. The point I want to make here, and as we come to an end, is the issue in public policy is anthropology. Rights versus righteousness. There are millions of atheists, and you heard this last night. And actually, here's the point. Here is the place in public policy where the argument is. There are millions of atheists and agnostics as well as people of varieties of religions, degrees of spiritual beliefs, and they all have rights too. Did you hear that? Did you hear that last night? That is a cogent point. They have their rights. Who am I as a messianic Jew to put my belief on all these other people, particularly the suffering. That's none of my business. It's none of my business, except there is a, could you go back, or, that's fine, you go back to the other slide, except for one thing. There's an anthropology assumed here. And the anthropology that's assumed is that man is basically good. Next slide. Public policy ap um, application. Anthropology is the ground of dialogue. And I, you know, anyone in here who is a pro-euthanasia advocate, I would like to just lay this out. I don't want to be belligerent. I'm not trying to be sometimes the uh, insensitive, as one person called me, papal dog that I am, and by the way, as a conservative Baptist, I don't think I bark for the Pope. In fact, I'd rather, but I do like the Pope, by, by the way. Um, I think he writes interesting encyclicals. But I'm still not his dog. <laughs> anyway, I won't go off on that because I see my time is running away. Historical vindication of the radical woundedness of human nature. And this is where you in the pro-euthanasia movement, any of you in here, and I have a problem. If man was basically good, I would grant you this. I'd say, all right, fine. You know, if you want to off yourself, if you want to terminate your life, that is indeed your business. But the problem is the radical woundedness of man's nature. And here's where the ground of dialogue must be. Because you must show me that this is not going to broaden so that my progenitors will not find themselves in Dachau, in Auschwitz, and in places like that, because they have died there and suffered there. And you must show me that the nature of, of your particular argument is not a nature of depravity. You must show me that your euphemisms are, and your deceit does not reflect that depravity. Next slide. And I appeal to the, present, the past and present history. I am not a postmodern deconstructionist. I believe that history is valid. And if you don't look at history, you're destined to repeat it. You have the Holland, excuse me, it should be the Dutch experience, but my brother's forgiving the German experience and the Greco-Roman experience. Look at Scribonius Largus' preamble to medicine, where he detests the practice of euthanasia and infanticide that is going on in his particular culture, the abuse of the vulnerables. Look at the German experience, and look at what is occurring, according to, yes, the Remlink report, the facts in the Remlink report, in the Dutch experience. I submit to you that there is no evidence that this practice can be controlled. 